now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. Happy Monday. Brilliant start to the week. It's raining. <laughs> Sarcasm, please. Yeah. No room for it on a Monday morning. <laughs> you it's know your what? classic British sarcasm. I mean, over the weekend, it was it was steamy, to say the least, right? I mean, instead of yeah. raining, it was humid and warm. Maybe with the rain, we get a little bit of coolness coolness yeah <laughs> i hesitate <Coolness>. cool <laughs> humidity is what i like to call it <laughs> in case you didn't get the memo uh the monsoon season is upon us this will persist yeah. for weeks i believe <laughs> hopefully it'll be cut short though yeah all right so let's get started a busy week for us busy week for the president uh let's start with the upcoming nato summit this is our first keyword of the day Yoon to Washington. So President Yoon will depart for Washington today to attend a NATO summit. It will be Yoon's third consecutive attendance of an annual NATO summit, which happens to be the first for a South Korean president. What can we expect? Yeah, so he's becoming a regular at uh, the summit <laughs> uh, of, uh, and uh, is becoming a busy schedule for him now. Now, Yoon plans to issue a strong warning against uh, deepening ties between North Korea and Russia. That's one of the main agendas. And one of the main messages that he'll be sending, he'll also likely seek to strengthen security through international cooperation with key allies, especially in the face of uh, North Korean provocations. Now, before heading to Washington, you will stop in Hawaii, actually, for a two-day visit. He'll visit the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific and have a dinner meeting with the Korean community there. The following day, he'll visit the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command to reaffirm the strong South Korea-U.S. alliance. In Washington, Yoon will hold bilateral meetings with the leaders of at least five NATO member countries, including the Czech Republic, Sweden, Finland and Norway, as well as meeting with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. During these meetings, he'll discuss cooperation in energy and security, along with regional and international issues. He and his wife, uh, Kim gun will also attend a dinner hosted by Joe Biden and his wife at the White House. On Thursday, you will participate in a summit between NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, which also includes Japan, Australia and New Zealand, before attending the main NATO summit. A strong message criticizing North Korea-Russia military cooperation is expected during that mm -hmm. summit. Um, and meanwhile, possible bilateral summits with the U.S. and Japan, as well as the trilateral one on the sidelines of the NATO summit, have uh, yet to be confirmed. So we'll have to know um, uh, nearer to the time whether uh, such meetings will happen. As for the summit itself, it comes amid increased uncertainty due to the potential re-election of former U.S. President Donald Trump. Mm. If, uh, it also comes uh, amid the rise of far-right movements in major European countries as well. So there's this kind of effort to try to get some solidarity within the union. And now the meeting is expected to serve as a platform to assess, of course, the solidarity of NATO allies. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg said the most urgent task of the summit is to support Ukraine. Mm. Uh, Stoltenberg expects member states to agree on maintaining military support for Kyiv at around 40 billion euros. However, um, it's likely to be tough. There's some countries already that's kind of withdrawing from that. Uh, right. Hungary, for example, has withdrawn um, uh, from that kind of uh, support. Uh, the summit is also expected to officially approve uh, NATO-led security missions for Ukraine as well. And there's also going to be likely other discussions of solidarity mm. um, and some policy shifts uh, or pledges in light uh, of the fact that uh, Donald Trump may be re-elected to the White House. All right, we'll wait and see what comes out of the NATO summit set to begin on Tuesday local time. Let's move on to our second keyword of the day. Med strike measures. All right, we're already five months in, and the ball is in the government's court, it seems. They will announce measures regarding striking training doctors who refuse to return to work. They've alleviated some of the standing punishments, uh, but only 10% have returned to their posts. They'll be announced by Health Minister uh, Cho Gi Hong later today after a meeting. Right, so this will be Chul's first briefing since he announced the withdrawal of various orders targeting interns uh, and training hospitals last month. Uh, Chul had earlier pledged to introduce such measures in early July as hospitals need time to prepare for the recruitment of new junior doctors who will begin training in September. 
Uh, early last month, the government withdrew several orders directed at residents and their training hospitals, including orders to maintain medical services, uh, start work and bans on accepting resignation letters. It also halted the administrative process for license suspension, pe- uh, providing uh, a way for residents to return. However, as of Thursday, only 8% of 13,756 trainee doctors returned to the country's uh, 211 uh, training hospitals. So basically, they're falling on deaf ears. Uh, the government is also considering easing restrictions on the return of resigned trainee doctors, allowing them to apply for the second half of this year. Mm. Now, currently, residents who resign during their training period actually cannot return to the same subject and year uh, within one year. Now, to encourage returns, the government plans to relax uh, these restrictions. So the government is basically paving the way for mm. these striking residents and trainee doctors to return to work. But, uh, yeah, the numbers show that it's not uh, proving to be effective and residents aren't really listening. So um, we'll have to see what measures uh, do come up in that um, announcement today. All right. So awaiting the health minister's announcement later today and we'll pick up from there tomorrow. Let's move on to our yeah. third keyword of the day. <laughs> Minimum wage. So the ninth round of meeting, the tug of war between labor and management is to decide next year's minimum wage officially. Uh, tomorrow, the minimum wage commission will hold its ninth, again, plenary meeting where labor and management are expected to present their wage proposals for next year. All eyes are on whether we can exceed that 10,000 won mark for the very first time. What can we expect? Yeah, so the commission has already discussed the inclusion of contract workers and whether to apply different minimum wages by industry and previous meetings. Those meetings didn't go so well. Now they'll move on to the wage level itself. Uh, Management representatives who boycotted the eighth meeting in protest are expected to return for the ninth meeting. They had protested some Labour representatives physically blocking uh, the vote on differentiated wage application in the seventh meeting. Uh, Last year, the Commission set this year's minimum wage at 9,861 per hour. This leaves only 141 short of that uh, psychologically significant 10,001 mark. Now, since the minimum wage system started in 1988, the lowest increase rate was uh, 1.5% in 2021, setting the minimum wage at uh, 8,721 any higher increase rate will push it past uh, that 10,001 for next year. Now, Labour representatives are likely to demand a double-digit increase again this year. They are reportedly coordinating their demand to around 12,501. This would be a 26.8% increase from this year. Labour groups uh, argue for a significant increase to ensure the living standards of low-wage workers. They point out that actual real wages have decreased in the past couple of years due to high inflation. So uh, although the minimum wage has gone up, the actual money that people are getting, they're actually um, in the black or Mm. uh, in the red in Korea, I should say, uh, because, (laughs) yeah, they're simply getting more expensive. Now, On the other hand, management calls for stabilising the minimum wage, uh, citing the financial difficulties of small and medium-sized businesses. Management is expected to propose, therefore, a freeze at the current level. Now, after the initial proposals, both sides will enter a fierce debate to narrow the gap. They'll present several revised proposals during this process. Uh, If they can't agree, the public representatives uh, of the group may um, propose an appropriate range to facilitate discussions. If both sides do reach a consensus, that, of course, will be the decision. Mm. However, since agreement is difficult and the talks are likely to be tough, uh, the final decision is often made through a vote. Uh, The public representatives who hold the casting vote effectively make the decision. Uh, The final decision on next year's minimum wage is expected by next week at the latest. Now, according to the law, the minimum wage for the following year must be announced by August 5th. Um, Considering the administrative procedures required, mid-July is effectively the deadline for the decision. Uh, Mm. Therefore, two more meetings are actually scheduled for later this week. That's, of course, um, if uh, a decision or an agreement is uh, reached uh, for the meetings tomorrow. Of course, those meetings aren't necessary, but it is unlikely that any consensus will be reached uh, by tomorrow. So... We'll have to see. But uh, it is a lengthy and drawn out process. uh, But uh, we'll have to see if any agreements are made. All right. With that, I move on to our fourth keyword of the day. 
Record car exports. So let's take a look at automobile export numbers. Korea's car exports are estimated to have reached a record $37 billion for the first half of the year. The milestone is mainly due to eco-friendly vehicles and SUVs continuing to perform well. So EVs are doing okay. SUVs are doing okay. That feels like it cancels each other out. Tell us the details, environmentally speaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of SUVs are diesel powered. So yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of questions surrounding, you know, it's eco-friendliness, uh, if you will. Driven now, by demand. <laughs> uh, driven by demand, of course, yes. Uh, now, a significant driver of this growth was the increase in exports to the U.S., uh, which surged by nearly 30% from the same period last year to about $18.5 billion. This accounted for nearly half of the total automobile exports in the first half of the year. It's also up 8.5 percentage points from last year as well. Now, so of course, the U.S. is becoming a, a major market for mm-hmm. Korean exporters. Now, cars made up 28.7 percent of Korea's total exports to the U.S. in the first half, marking it the largest single export item as well. Now, in contrast, however, exports to the European Union fell by 30 uh, percent. Uh, the EU doesn't really tend to be a major market for Korean car exporters. Uh, exports to the Middle East and Latin America decreased by 18.7 percent and 8.3 percent, uh, respectively. Uh, after hitting a record high in the first half of 2014, car exports did reach another peak actually last year at $35.65 billion dollars. That was nearly a uh, 46.5% uh, increase from the previous year. Now, just one year later, this re- uh, record has been surpassed again, continuing the growth trend in car exports. Now, car exports have shown positive growth for four consecutive years, actually, since 2021, based on uh, the first half of each year. Uh, By vehicle type EV exports, which had been uh, rapidly growing until last year, decreased by 17.5% in the first half of this year uh, to $7 billion. Um, dollars uh, kind of the EV market demand has kind of been stagnant uh, so far this year. Now, although EV exports saw a significant increase in the first half of last year, they couldn't avoid the global EV market's kind of temporary stagnation mm. this year. However, the industry still considers this a good performance amid the EV market's challenges. Um, Hybrid cars, uh, exports uh, of them increased by nearly 20 percent and internal combustion engine car exports rose by just over 7 percent, leading to an overall increase in car exports. The tendency is now of people buying hybrid cars rather than um, EV cars. Now, especially noteworthy is the continuous growth of EV exports to the US. So the US still has a strong demand for EVs. Uh, it's already surpassed last year's first half figure of $250 million. Mm. Uh, initially, there were concerns that Korean EVs would struggle in the US market, especially due to the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, however, continuous negotiations with the US government uh, secured subsidies for commercial eco-friendly vehicles like rental and lease cars, turning the situation around. And now automobiles are becoming one of Korea's main export items alongside semiconductors. And the Korea Automobile uh, Manufacturers Association expects total car exports for the year uh, to reach $74.7 billion. So, yeah. yeah, a significant milestone and an increasing trend. So cars are doing quite well in terms of exports. Not not so much domestically, but mm-hmm. they are doing well overseas. All right, with that, move on to our final keyword of the day. Labour Party takeover. So we're heading on over to the results of the UK election. It looks like the new prime minister needs to adjust fast. He's headed, headed to the NATO summit in no time, and he has a different set of policies from the previous Conservative government. So the newly elected prime minister, Keir Starmer, has declared a national reset and immediately began reversing the policies of the previous administration. What's the hmm. latest, my British man? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I have a lot to say on this, but uh, we don't have enough time. We're running out. But uh, yes, the Labour <laughs> government announced the uh, cancellation of the Conservative government's flagship policy, which was the Rea- uh, Rwanda asylum plan that aimed at deterring illegal immigration by sending asylum seekers mm. crossing the English Channel in small boats to Rwanda. Uh, it faced criticism for human rights violations and conflicts with international law and was never actually implemented. Arguing that the policy was costly and ineffective, the Starmer government made its first policy decision to cancel it, 
signaling its uh, intent to correct the previous government's failings. Uh, it also revealed that reforms to what Starmer called the broken public health system had already begun. Um, Starmer had also vowed an immediate reset of relations with the devolved governments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, I won't get, we don't have enough time, so I won't get into the kind of politics and the decision making and the autonomies of these governments in mm. too much detail. Um, uh, but he has a busy uh, debut on the international stage quite soon. Uh, Starmer will fly to Washington for the NATO summit. Uh, and his new foreign secretary, David Lamy, is also embarking on a tour of EU member states, uh, Germany, Poland and Sweden in his first weekend in office. That's, of course, uh, to push for efforts to reset relations with the EU, especially in light mm -hmm. of Brexit as well. Of course, they can't reverse Brexit, so they're trying to do their best to try better relations uh, with uh, EU member states in terms of uh, Brexit policies. All right, so the new prime minister must project leadership quickly. We'll wait and see what comes out of NATO summit. He's also to host a gathering of European leaders next week. What comes out of that? We'll have other opportunities. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, <laughs> you're very welcome. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.